In Rock was Deep Purple's most powerful and cohesive of albums, and a message for anyone that mistook this band for a novelty act that dabbled with orchestras. The famous Mark II line of Deep Purple launched in Rock in uh, 1970, filled with dynamic and powerful numbers that placed the emphasis upon musical and vocal virtuosity. Moving away from the more psychedelic, flowery shirted vanilla fudgery of the previous albums, Purple looked to attract a hard rock bass with music that amped up the heaviness of the first Led Zeppelin album, but with its influences more from British and American rock and roll rather than looking to Willie Dicks in the muddy waters or indeed the heavily scented flowery baroque pop of the 1960s. The band originally operated under the name Roundabout and in 1966 decided they needed a new moniker. Originally they came up with the name uh, Orpheus, how 1960s, then Concrete God, which is a bit Spinal Tap, isn't it? Then actually Sugar Lump, which was a bit 1990s girl band really. Thankfully they settled on Deep Purple. Now Deep Purple is actually the, the name of the Richie Blackmore's grandmother's favourite song. It's a, it was a, a popular standard that uh, written in 1933 that's been covered by everybody from Bing Crosby to Screaming Jay Hawkins. But I suspect Richie Blackmore's grand knew it from brother and sister duo April Stevens and Nino Tempo, who had a massive hit with it in 1963. And their set at this time would often uh, include long, drawn out numbers, nothing new there. But it also included Mandrake Root. Now, Mandrake Root was actually a number that Blackmore had come up with earlier, although it wasn't entirely original. I mean, the song was actually written by a chap named uh, Bill Parkinson. It was called Lost Soul. It was played by Screaming Lord Such and his band The Savages when, of course, Blackmore was in there. And, of course, they had um, they'd performed an extended version of uh, Painted Black, The Rolling Stones Painted Black, which would often serve as a vehicle for Ian Pace's drum solo. That honour, of course, would fall to the mule a bit later on. More significantly, they'd failed to make any real commercial impact with the three previous albums that tapped into that heavy, organ-fused vanilla fudge sound, as I said earlier. Uh, with a singer, of course, that was more like um, a ballad-singing pop crooner, really, who certainly didn't possess the set of tonsils that uh, Gillen brings to the fore. Interestingly, Gillen, uh, when he played with the band The Moonshiners, he would alternate between playing drums and singing. He used to go under the name of Garth Rocket until he changed his name to Jess Thunder when he was with the Javelins. And that is before um, being recruited as singer for the wonderful episode six. Whilst Purple were actually looking for a new singer that considered Rod Stewart, I think it's because Blackmore was a huge fan of the Jeff Beck group, and you can blame him. But eventually the decision to recruit, or Nick really, the singer, uh, Gillen, and of course Glover from episode 6 was made. Interestingly, the original singer and bassist uh, were unaware, Simper and Evans were oblivious to this rock and roll chicanery. It was left to the management to sack them. Gillen says in his autobiography, we recorded Hallelujah and generally settled in full time. Meanwhile, the still unsuspecting Rod and Nick were completing dates with the band. Their last date set for the top rank Cardiff on the 4th of July 1969. The In Rock title was a way of distancing themselves from the In Concert title of the concerto. And that cacophony that opens the album uh, with Speaking, of course Speaking was originally known at this time as Kneel and Pray, was very much... Uh, a manifesto, a kind of a new manifesto for this band, and couple this with the hypnotising crescendos of Child in Time. Uh, there's no doubt that there was a, a new genre being forged, well if not forged, at least augmented I think. And the album of course closes with, a, it collapses into the feedback squall that is Hard Loving Man. New Musical Express said of this record that it's uh, good meaty rock and roll all the way. Interestingly, this record was recorded over um, little snatches of time in between gigging. In many ways, the tracks on this album are skillful synthesis of what was, was already there. Into the Fire crackles away, reminiscent of Jimi Hendrix's uh, Purple Haze and possibly Cream's Politician. 
Black Knight, um, not originally on this album, of course, but nevertheless, it's part of the same sessions, it was a skillful augmentation of uh, the Blue Magoo's We Ain't Got Nothing Yet with its filched riff from Ricky Nelson's Summertime. <laughs> Even the rhapsodic Child in Time was a track uh, partly filched from Bombay Calling, uh, a number by the US psychedelic band uh, A Beautiful Day. But that aside, there's no doubt that the musical bar was raised with this album, I think partly due to the wonderful rhythm section they had of Ian Pace and uh, Roger Glover the diamond hard riffing of Richie Blackmore and the neoclassical noodlings of John Lord and that's not in any way to forget the glass worrying shriek of Ian Gillen whose uh, uh, vocal histrionics of course would become a almost uh, a bit of a cliche for a lot of today's uh, heavy metal tonsil torturers and the album sleeve is indicative of this monumental statement in rock with the band's identity carved in stone in many respects, Richie Blackmore was uh, at this point started to push for a harder, more abrasive sound, a more punishing sound. As I've said, a sound that's drawn from the paradigms of British and American rock and roll. Gone were the Beatles and Neil Diamond covers and they began thrashing out their own material. That famous Mark II lineup uh, recorded, uh, I think their first song was Hallelujah, which was a song actually written by Roger Greenaway and Roger Cook and originally released as I Am The Preacher by the Derek Lawrence Statement earlier the same year. I am the preacher. This album was recorded at the Hanwell Community Centre uh, at the same time that they were recording a thrashing out the material for this album. Another band called Spice were more or less in the same locale who would of course later become Uriah Heep and my word what a what a din they must have made together. History in terms of heavy metal was being forged here, I think. Let's not forget the first Sabbath album just predates the release of this album by a few months. We went on to record the album at IBC Studios at Portland Place. They'd all crowd around the mixing desk, pushing the levels up, which uh, I think perhaps adds to the, the kind of fur and distortion you get on this record. It in many ways makes it sound more, more feral, more powerful. Speaking was effectively a homage to 1950s rock and roll. And interestingly, the musical bit you get at uh, just before the song starts, the uh, John Lord uh, keyboard part was actually called Waffle or, or Waffle in D, I think. Uh, speaking, of course, developed from the a bass riff by Roger Glover. That bass riff was meant to emulate Jimi Hendrix's fire. And I love the way John Lord's opening organ piece launches into that pre-punk rant of uh, referencing numerous rock and roll standards that Gillen uh, borrowed lyrically from, you know, good golly, Miss Molly, Tutti Frutti in the Battle of New Orleans. Bloodsucker, in many respects, is a, a cautionary tale um, about the victim of the more parasitic elements in life. But it's more of a, I think, a moderate rocker compared to the opening track. And Child in Time, of course, is the true masterpiece embodying a whole array of theatrics, I think, and drama to it. To Lord's uh, jazzy organ and eerie vocals that lead to the histrionic wails of uh, Gillen. And of course that incredible midsection with that wonderful, wonderful guitar solo by Richie Blackmore. But it has a gentleness to it as well. It's a little bit Age of Aquarius in some places, I think. A prog vibe, even. Many have uh, pointed to this track on this album which should, to suggest that Deep Purple had one foot in the almost kind of progressive rock, or maybe they were, you could argue, they were progenitors of the progressive metal genre. As I've said, Child in Time borrows from uh, Beautiful Day's Bombay Calling, but they in themselves went on to steal Deep Purple's Ring That Neck and turned it into Don and Dewey on their second album, Marrying Maiden. The Marrying Maiden album was released in 1970. <laughs> Child in Time is a kind of anti-war number infused with that Cold War paranoia which is and perhaps is now uh, raging at the time. Lots of metaphors to do with uh, uh, battle, the semantic field of this number is certainly uh, to deal with warfare, bullets flying, ricochet, uh, guns. Uh, it certainly encompasses the theme of war and man's inhumanity to man. 
Many see this as a kind of example of art rock or heavy metal art rock, if you like. Interestingly, in his autobiography, Ian Gillan says of this song, Child in time remains elusive for me to sing to this very day. The timing and waiting of the delivery can be a nightmare if I'm not in the right frame of mind. And for a number that was written without a narrative style, it would shock me to learn as far away as the 1990s that it had been adopted as an anthem for some resistance groups who were operating underground in Eastern European countries. Interestingly, August saw the band play the um, National Jazz and Blues Festival. I mean, the running order for that uh, night was uh, Juicy Lucy were on the bill, as were Yes. Um, Purple was supposed to go on after Yes, I believe, but Yes was so late, uh, probably uh, thanks to Chris Squire, that uh, Purple were persuaded to go on first. Blackmore instructed roadie Ian Hansford to set fire to the Amstring Mandrake route. Uh, unfortunately, the the, um, the back cloth also went up in flames. Melody Maker recorded the guitars were flung around the stage in wild abandon. Certainly not Steve Howe's guitar, that's for sure. Flight of the Rat, of course, is a, a little bit of a parody of Korsakoff's uh, Flight of the Bumblebee. And it's very much a, kind of a drug song, an anti-drug song, if you like. I mean, this band, let's not forget, were not that much into drugs. They're more into booze, really. Drinking was their thing. People at Purple were definitely a drinking band. That is until, I think, Glenn Hughes joined. Uh, and, of course, rather tragically, uh, Tommy Bolin a bit later on. Flight to the Rat is one of my favourite tracks on this album, but I don't think it's ever been performed live by the band. Bloodsucker was, um, many people took Bloodsucker to be a kind of an admission that this band did drugs. They would often deny it. <laughs> and of course, their denial was poo-pooed, as uh, you would say that, wouldn't you? Although Ian Gillen has uh, gone on to say that a bit later on in his career, he would dabble in substances. But it was about this time, of course, the release of this album. I think it was Tim Rice that heard Gillen singing Child in Time. And I think it was him that suggested uh, to uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber that they could uh, perhaps work with this singer. And of course, the rest, as they say, is history. Living Wreck starts with a wonderful uh, drum intro by uh, Ian Pace, perhaps foreshadowing Fireball, I think. The screechy organ part during the verses can be a bit abrasive, but it's soon forgotten by the fine uh, musical interlude of the bridge. Hard Loving Man is essentially a song about shagging, I think, and this a very dramatic and theatrical ending to this album as it collapses into this feedback squall and frenzy, perhaps mirroring the way the kind of album starts. Hard Loving Man actually started, I think, from a, a jam session, uh, primarily between Roger Glover and uh, John Lord. It's interesting how John Lord's piercing organ uh, builds towards an uneasy tension and, and all the kind of little fragments of this number. And we have to talk a little bit about Black Knight. As I've said, this song was not featured on this album, but was part of the sessions and was a result of the record company putting some pressure on the band to come up with a, a single. And by August, Black Knight entered the charts. Uh, it got to number two. It was kept uh, kept off the top spot by Frida Payne's A Band of Gold. Anyway, I think uh, Deep Purple in Rock is the, the finest of Deep Purple albums. I know Machine Head is much more polished, much more consummate, I think, in a much better album in many respects. But the, the sheer feral energy of, of this uh, band, a band that really wanted to prove something, that they weren't just a novelty act that... Uh, messed about with orchestras. It's very much apparent in, in, the, in the energy that comes from this uh, this album. Anyway, you've been watching a, a review by Classic Album Review. Hope you're well, staying safe, but more importantly, that you keep listening. <laughs>